Rick says when I speak, it's like a 12-year-old doing a book report. So let's get to the book report. I love the Word of God. Last week, we called it Fun with the Pharisees because I love those scriptures. They were so blind, they were doing the goofiest things and could not see it. Unfortunately, we also do goofy things when we're blind. So this is going to be part two, but I want to recap. The one thing I said not to do last week is don't be dumb. I met this man who was, uh, he was cohabitating with his lady and he had never heard that fornication was a sin. But he so loved God when he read that scripture that fornication is a sin, he said, I did not know. I'm going to make this right now. I'm going to make this right. And so sometimes in our sin, a lot of times our heart, our conscience will tell us, but there's some things we just don't know. Until the word shines a light on, and then we can go, oh, I probably shouldn't be doing that. So I'm going to explain to you, there's a picture on here that this is called the eight woes of the Pharisees. Jesus said to the Pharisees, woe, eight times. And I have an animal that I put with each of them to help you remember what they do. And then I'm going to tell you what spirit, because I'm going to put some deliverance in here, was behind each one of the woes. Okay, so here we go. Let's jump in. Uh, Matthew 23, 1 through 4, I, I couldn't help but just go ahead and read the beginning to set us up. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. And I was like, they sit in Moses' seat? Because all I know of the Pharisees is him going, whoa, and you know, you, you brood of vipers. Why would Jesus say to listen, they sit in Moses' seat? It's the place of authority. So they did have authority. And so Jesus said, because they have authority, therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. Basically, they were telling the right things. But he said, but don't do according to their works. He's saying, go ahead and do what they're saying. That's right. But don't do what they do. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. And I was reminded of back in the Old Testament when in Exodus, where Pharaoh was getting angry with the Israelites, and he commanded that they make brick. And then he became so angry that they were wanting to go that he wasn't going to give them the materials to make the brick, but still demand that they make the brick. I'm not going to give you straw, but make the brick anyway. And that's a pharisaical attitude. If we break that down in the church, well, I will tell you, my daddy, back when he was a perfect heathen, used to say, do what I say and not what I do. Any of y'all's parents ever say that? He'd be smoking a cigarette and he would say, you better do what I say. And I'm like, this is not making sense. Even to a little child, that does not make sense. Hey, Debbie, I made this one just for you. There are people that come in and say, there's trash all over that floor, but will not, if they can, pick it up. Listen, she is not the janitor of this house. But there have been people come out of the bathroom and say there are dirty towels in the floor. Why should she go in there and pick them up when this, we belong to this church. This church belongs to us. This is the house of God. Why not pick up the house of God's towels instead of telling somebody? However, if somebody puked in the bathroom, we'll be calling Bernie. <laughs> he, has, he has a stomach of steel. That's a whole different thing. So anyway, that was just a little special that I put on there. Okay, Matthew 23, 5 through 7. Now don't misconstrue this verse. What happens a lot of times when people read the Bible is they will take it out of context and make it mean something that it doesn't mean. So what are we just talking about? We're talking about the fact that um, they want to be seen, that they're prideful. So verse 5 says, but all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. Do you see the picture of the phylactery? What that is, is it has scripture in it and they were so holy. They would put that scripture in there and it would look like, you know, they're, they're putting the word of God in their minds. 
But what they would do so that everybody would see it, they would make it really big. And they would, they wanted, they, they spread out their garments of how holy they were. It's kind of thing when we think we look awesome. And we come into a room, not because we're joyful with our new garment, but because we want people to see us and we make big flashy things. I mean, I have done that before. But they love the best places at feasts. Don't they just sound like a joy? The best seats in the synagogues, the greetings in the marketplace, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. So these dudes, remember what I said, when they, when they, the law of God, they loved it. And so originally, I think they really had a heart after God. So then they made up rules to be able to, to um, be able to do it. I have rules in my own life because I'm sanguine in nature and I have a thousand ideas sometimes in one day. And I have a rule. When I'm writing books, I write one at a time or I will have 25 on my laptop. So I will write. If I get an idea, I'll write that down. And But I make myself continue that book. And it's a very um, difficult thing for my flesh. That works for me so that I can do the job. But if I demanded that every writer could only write one book at a time, that would not work out with all of the other different personalities. I heard today where there's some other people doing deliverance differently. And guess what? They were kind of down on us for how we were doing it. But it is okay to pray differently. It's okay if somebody to touch their arm and pray. It's okay. I mean, unless it's against the word of God. We have to get to the point that we're not Pharisees and there's one way to do it. You know, we, when we do communion, we have the little wafer and the pre-served cup. Some people are like, oh, no, that's not how you do it. Well. It's not an issue, except maybe for pride and traditions for some people. So the one thing that they said is they like to be called rabbi, rabbi. Yep. They like to be called the name to look really cool. And so here's what Jesus said. But he's telling them, but you do not be called rabbi, which means teacher. For one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father. For one is your father who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers. For one is your teacher, the Christ. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. And there are people that read that and go, oh my goodness, I will never call anybody teacher. They're missing the whole Pharisee point. Because if you look over in Ephesians 4 and 11, Christ gave apostles, pastors, he gave teachers. So how does that make sense? We're missing the heart of the matter. The heart of the matter is Jesus is the teacher, the father, and the uh, Pharisees are coming in to usurp his authority, loving to be called the precious name so everyone would think highly of them. But look, they, people will argue, don't call somebody, you know, don't call him father, call him daddy. They are stuck on something whenever they don't read 11, but he who is greatest among you shall be your servant and whoever exalts himself will be humbled. That's the meat of the verse, not in making laws out of what is said above there. It's an example, kind of like in the New Testament where it says, if your arm offends you, cut it off. Hey, I met a woman who literally plucked out her eyeballs because they offended her. Yeah, when I worked at a psychiatric hospital, she ended up in there. And so... There are, I mean, I would rather cut it off than enter into heaven sinning, but that's not what the, the heart of the message is talking about. And Pharisees are really good about grabbing on to a, well, <clears throat> grabbing on to a piece of the scripture and not seeing it for its entirety or seeing um, what the heart of the message is. So let's, let's start with the five woes. Now, what does woe mean? It's an exclamation of grief. Yeah. Whoa. Remember when Jesus mourned over Jerusalem? Jesus isn't being a smart aleck with them. He's grieving over the Pharisees. Whoa to the Pharisees. There's grief over them. There's bad things coming for them. So I think we need to know what the, those are. So the number one woe, and I put a fox, a sly fox for that, is they only taught about God. They didn't know him. They taught about God. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, 
For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Now, that's the spirit of Antichrist. You don't go in yourself, and you won't let others go in. I watched this program where there was this mother. There was some guy evangelizing on the street, and he starts trying to tell her about God. And she says, there is no God. And he's like, I fear for your life. She said, don't you fear for me? There's no afterlife. There's no salvation. There's no Jesus. And don't say it again. And he's like, but would you teach your children that? And a little like five and six-year-old children are standing up and looking. She said, I will never. See, she refuses to go in and she refuses to allow her children to go in as well. I mourned so much for that. It impacted me. Cody was talking about Sunday night about going and speaking at a church in um, Vegas. And when the power of God hits and these college students, they're speaking in tongues, they're glorifying God, they're getting set free. One of the leaders who is a very wealthy person stood up and stopped him from coming back. And was like, oh, no, we won't go. And he stopped everyone else from entering in. That man is a modern-day Pharisee with the spirit of Antichrist. Number two, the woe to. And I put on here my husband's least favorite critter, the weasel. (laughs) This is weaselly. They devoured widows' houses, in private, of course, and then they prayed like they were on Broadway. Let's read the scripture with that. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses for a pretense, make long prayers, therefore you will receive greater condemnation. That's why I called them a weasel. You know what they would do? Back in that day, women did not really inherit. So if a man died, then their home or whatever they had would go into the hands of a legal expert. Who were the legal experts? the scribes and the Pharisees. So they would get control of the property, the land, and that widow would be dependent upon their generosity and their honesty. But Jesus said, I see you devouring widows. And you know what Jesus thinks of orphans and widows? I don't think you want to touch them. So he called out their sin right there. And he said, not only do you take what belongs to a widow, use it for your own good. Then you stand up in front of everyone and you want everyone to applaud you as you say these long prayers. So in private, they're snakes and weasels, but in public, they want everyone to think they are super religious. Have you ever prayed and hope it sounded, sounded impressive? That's a Pharisee, and I have done it. (laughs) It's the spirit of greed. The spirit of greed will do something like this. Guess what we have? We have people before. I don't know if it's current or not, because I don't know who the weasels are. Pick up an, uh, an offering envelope and put nothing in it, but they didn't want anybody to see them not giving. And they put empty envelopes into the offering bucket. You Pharisee weasel. (laughs) How weaselly is that? I mean, if you're not going to give, just own up to it. Maybe you don't have the money or maybe you've got a bunch in your pocket and you don't want to give it. Who cares? But don't be a weasel about it. (laughs) What about, you know, it's one thing. If you go into Goodwill or you go to a yard sale probably more like Goodwill, and they've got $5 on something you know is worth $100. They've priced it, fine, you take it. But to go in someone's house or see somebody with something that they don't know the value of and you do, it's worth $1,000 and you say, I'll give you 25 for it right now. Shoot, I'll just give you 30 for it. When in your heart is greed and you grab it, we knew somebody that would do that in our family. They would, they would milk it out of somebody who probably was poor and then come out and brag that they got it for $25 and it's worth $1,000. That's a weasel. In the house of God, we are not called to be weasels. 
As a matter of fact, I think it's righteous if somebody offers you something and you know it's $1,000 and they're saying, I'll just use 25. I think it's right to say, you know, I'd love to give you $25, but do you know how much this is worth? I think that's honorable. Number three, I have a tiger on here. Because you know what they'll do? Tigers, they can travel six to 12 miles during the day to, to look for a prey. And they got these soft pads on their feet. I'm amazed by a tiger. But if I ever saw one out in the wild, I would, I don't, I'd pass out. Because <laughs> they, those things are beautiful, but they are wild and strong. But what the Pharisees would do, they would do everything. They were zealous in their power to find someone, convert them, and then make them worse than them. So number three, woe, he said, woe to you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, which means mean like you win somebody over to how you're thinking and you're doing. And one, when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. They're aggressive workers. The spirit of error. There I see people with a spirit of error working really hard to find cohorts in error. We had a man one time that came in here. Everything pastor said he twisted, but I saw him start sitting in the back and when uh, people would be converted, he would start saying things erroneous and Truly, his converts ended up being worse than he was. Mocking the church, mocking tongues. Pharisee tiger. I think that's why it's important to walk with the wise. Not everybody evangelizing has a good heart. I don't know about you. I usually typically think people are good until they prove me bad. I mean, different people have different personalities, but I think what we're missing a lot is the gift of discernment to be able to discern if people are legit or not, because a Pharisee looks perfect on the outside. Remember I told you all last week about that woman who sent me that nasty gram about, she was talking about this person, how glorious and wonderful they were. And then she was talking down about one of our girls. And I know for a fact that the person she talked about stays in perversion, will not stay consistent, grubs people out of money. And then he, she pointed to the girl and was like complaining about her pants, which I doubt she has the money to buy new ones. That's a Pharisee complaining right there is what that was. Number four, they found more value in gold and silver than in holiness. And the reason I chose a pig, because a pig would just as soon as step on some pearls as they would something, uh, a rock or muck. They can't tell the difference. So Matthew in 23, 16 says, woe to you blind guides. See, before he would say, woe to you hypocrites. And now he says, blind guides who say, whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing, but whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obliged to perform it. What that is, is the spirit of perversion. And I want to talk to you about what perversion does. People often think only about pornography is perversion, but perversion is twisting anything from truth. For a lot of people that end up in funky marriages, they will be sexually active, with before marriage and then they get into marriage and they want no intimacy. See, it's perverted. They should be celibate outside of marriage. They should be enjoying the company of their spouse in marriage. It's turned around. It's twisted. So in this, what they would do is they would say, if you're going to make a vow, don't make a vow by the temple, but yeah, make it by the gold. Their value was toward the gold. Their value was toward things that Jesus didn't give a rip about. Unfortunately, we do the same thing in our value. Valuing our chair more than a visitor. Valuing our, the fact that somebody's made a mess more than our children. So what we have to do is take a real good hard look at ourselves and say, what am I valuing? What do I think is more important? Because I don't want to be a Pharisee. You know, Judas 
whenever uh, Jesus was uh, being anointed by that woman, he was like, why are you taking this money that it could have been to the poor and you're pouring it on Jesus's feet? He was being a Pharisee. He saw the poor more valuable than the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and the fact that he was about to give his life. See, we can easily do that. I'll give you another example is that when, let's say pastor's preaching or somebody's ministering and we begin to get offended and we go over to, I go over to Randy and I was like, Randy, I don't think that's just right. Do you see what I'm seeing is I am finding more value in offense and being disagreeable than the fact that I'm causing division, that I could be causing someone not to come to the Lord. I've seen this many times where the altar call would happen and somebody found more value in um, catching up with someone than they, than they did a soul. Back before Willie Sis got saved, over and over, I would see him get full of conviction. And then I would watch this man walk over to him. Hey, buddy, how you doing? And until he was relieved that conviction was gone and out the door he would go. Because we find more value in something else rather than what God is doing. And we won't know we're doing that unless we invite him to say, God, show me what I think is important. Five, I chose the camel because of the scripture. They taught the law, but did not practice some of the most important parts of the law. And oh, and down here in the bottom is a little flea, a little gnat compared to this big camel because of the scripture. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Y'all like how I say hypocrites? For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. Those are spices. So that like if they got a pound of spice, they were going to take 10% in that give. They weren't just giving uh, of gold, but everything they got, they were very careful that they gave, which was good. But he's saying, you do that. But you've neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These ought you to have done. So he's saying, yes, you ought to have paid your tithe, but you should have done that without leaving the others undone. Blind guides. Now, every time he says blind guides, it's an inclination that someone's following them. Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. It should be easier to eat a gnat than just to swallow a camel, but that's what they were doing. Now, what they would do in order to not eat a gnat, they would literally strain their things to keep the gnat out. But take so much time on these little things and then gobble up that whole camel in one bite. Okay. That's the spirit of error and it's the spirit of pride. So which is weightier? although both are important, is it more important to teach our children how to multiply or to not lie? Is it more important to teach them how to throw a ball or to read the word? Some people swallow the camel of not going to church. They strangle at loving people. Some people, some people swallow paying ties, but strangle at being corrected. You know, you're doing, you're kind of doing the right thing, but in the weightier matters, not so much. And I think it's very hypocritical that we don't take a look at that. And I tell you how you know, what you applied, you think more highly of. Watch Facebook posts, what people praise their children and others for doing. That's what they're proud of. And seldom is it, it's most of the time the gnat and not the camel. Occasionally not so. Moving on. Woe number six. They presented an an appearance of being clean. Isn't that a pretty peacock? Those are such, what was God thinking when he did that? I often think of that with a cow. Looks like he made a lump and just pulled some things out of it. But with a peacock that is so pretty and how they spread their feathers, our God is amazing and an incredible 
creator, worthy of our praise. And these people that thought they knew him, woe number six, woe to you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. The spirit of pride, and it is the spirit of divination. Why is the spirit of divination? You are one thing and presenting another, doing a sleight of hand. Have y'all ever seen that? Somebody that looks great on the outside, but inside they are filth. Let me tell y'all a story. I think I've forgiven. I was 17 years old. I was engaged to be married to somebody that was not Dennis Piper. And um, I, I sang at this time, and this group I was with did this parade. And I was dressed in this ball gown. And the guy was, that was singing with me, he was dressed all up, and it was like in public. And so we are on a float. I hate parades. I don't know if it's because of this, but now I don't do the parade thing. I might need deliverance for that. <laughs> anyway, so we do this, and they've got us hooked up where we're singing as we're going by. We won this prize and stuff. And I thought that was an exciting time back when I liked parades, I guess. But when I got back to church the next morning, that must have been a Saturday or I don't know when it was, this um, woman who was a pastor's wife, who was an old bitty Pharisee gossip, am I bitter? I don't know. I'm, <laughs> I don't think I am. But uh, so... What she did was she went to my boyfriend and she told him these awful things I was doing on the float that I was more than making out with this guy on the float and reported this thing that I didn't even do with him. Why would he think I would be doing it in public? It didn't make any sense. So during that service, I was just getting wind of this lie Whenever they did this thing that they used to do, and they said, everybody, get up and hug everyone and tell them you love them. I had no idea who had spread the lie. So I, in my, in, I was very naive at 17 and 35 and 45. And I walked up to her, and I did the hug, and she whispered in my ear, I love you, but I do not like who you are. It stunned me. I'd never had anybody be mean to me like that and what she did. She spread that everywhere. Everyone believed her. That was the first time I ever experienced somebody telling awful lies. And um, thank the Lord, I did not marry him because of that. <laughs> and I uh, ended up married to Dennis Piper, whom I love like crazy. But I want to tell you, the way that we handle the Pharisees that have the dead man bones inside and they look good on the outside, it's going to say more about our character because it will always come out, but we need to position ourselves that these Pharisees, when they come, that we have enough discernment to understand who they are. We have enough of fruit of the spirit to behave properly and have wisdom. That's what we need to do. But we also need to make sure we're not doing it, that we don't have something hidden in here. Because even though you're a believer, you could have some dead man's bones in there. If you have anyone you have not forgiven, you have dead man bones inside of you. And you are disobeying the New Testament. You are disobeying what Jesus said. We must forgive. Yet if we don't forgive, we're walking around like we're a believer. Yet we have dead man's bones inside of us. Which is the spirit of pride and the spirit of divination. Or it could be. Number seven they were beautiful outside, but deadly inside. This is a little bit different than number six. But have you all ever heard of a blue ringed octopus? I chose that because their, their toxicity is a thousand times worse than cyanide. So if you all see one of those, y'all ocean lovers, you don't mess with them. What they do is they mess with your, your muscles and your muscles won't constrict. They're very deadly, just like a Pharisee. In Matthew, 
Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead man's bones and uncleanliness. I just missed, mixed six and seven up, apparently. Even so, you are, you are also outwardly appear to be righteous, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And that is the spirit of pride, the spirit of murder, and the spirit of witchcraft and divination. Now, how was six different? Let's look at this. The number six was different because they would clean the outside and inside they had extortion and indulgence. So on that one, I should have said they are just, they want everything their own way. They want the best of the seeds. It's all about them. Number seven, they're beautiful outside, but they are devourers. Full of uncleanliness, full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And then finally, number eight, they professed a high regard for the dead prophets of old. This is one that still, it's one of those blind ones. I'm like, how can you not see this? Have you ever been to somebody who's misinterpreting the scripture or they're being cruel and you're like, how, what's, how can you not see this? I put a lion on here because the Bible says the enemy is like a lion who wants to go devour, but it says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. So what are they doing? They're going up to the old prophets and they're like glorifying their tombs and their monuments. Even though their forefathers killed the prophets, they're saying, had we been alive, spirit of pride, we would not have killed the prophets. There's a spirit of murder there because who are they saying this to? It's also right. It's a lying spirit as well. It's a spirit of Antichrist as well. They are telling the one that the prophets prophesied about that they would never kill the prophets, yet they are planning to kill Jesus. How twisted. They can't even see that. They proclaim to love Abraham, yet they hate the God of Abraham. And what I, what, I, what I wanted to get out of this is probably one of the most common things when people come to see me is the lies they actually choose to believe. One time I thought, you know, if I were in Jesus's day, I would not have cried, crucify him. Who in the world do I think I am? Because regularly in my lifetime, I have crucified him afresh disobeyed what he said, ashamed. And until the Lord began growing me, I am not any better than those who cried crucify him. Yet in my pride and in lying to myself, I'd like to think that I wasn't. And so it will take a great deal of humility to look at ourselves for real and say, you know what? I may be lying to myself about this. And the only way you can know that you are lying to yourself is if the word of God illuminates it. So one of the things we do um, in deliverance, listen, if you don't know where to start, if somebody is traumatized or they don't, you don't, they're telling you a prayer request and you're like, I have no idea. I don't know where to start. My very best tip is start with a truth. The Bible says it's the truth that sets the captive free. As you can tell, it's lies that bound the Pharisee. So what I try to do is to get a truth in there. Now, even if they're not, if they don't want freedom, if they don't want God, if they hate me, I still will try to find a truth. And it doesn't matter what it is. The truth is so powerful. When you inject it, it starts working right away. So number one, talk and no do the spirit of Antichrist. We have to do what the word says and be people of our word. Number two, we can't be weasels, taking advantage of the poor, hiding our sin, and then boasting about prayer, the spirit of greed. Number three, with that old tiger, making bad decisions, gathering people and injecting them with bad doctrine, the spirit of error. Listen, that's all over gossip. We can't be talking about people, y'all. 
And I just made up my mind about something. Somebody said something about someone I love. And I was thinking about what to do about it when they left. And I thought the next time, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to say, I love you. And I love them. And you are breaking my heart. Talking, a person I love, talking about them in front of me. I can't take that. I'm not going to take that. I'm making a plan to step up to um, that uh, tiger. Number four, a pig, they saw value in gold, but not in God. And that's the spirit of perversion. Number five, where they could swallow a camel and strain out a gnat. They couldn't tell what was important because of spirit of error and of pride. Number six, it's all about appearance, not substance. A spirit of pride, a spirit of divination, only caring about how they were looked. Has the Lord ever invited you to come up and pray at the altar and you thought, well, I wonder how I will look? Number six, whoa. Number seven, beautiful outside, deadly inside. A spirit of pride, murder, witchcraft, and divination. We want no part of that. And number eight, accuse others but can't see our own lying selves. The spirit of lying and error and a witchcraft. And what we do about that is the same thing we do last week about being blind. We repent and confess it. And I'm a fan. Y'all don't have to do this. I'm not a Pharisee telling you have to do this. But for me, it is good for me to confess it. I will grab somebody that I trust and say, I confess that I'm having prideful thoughts. I confess this because I know the value of getting it out into the light. Have you ever seen, look this up, Google it. The animals that live at the bottom of the ocean, they can't do science research on them because when they bring them up, they can't tolerate the atmosphere and that light and they die. But they are the most grotesque animals you will ever see. Look up bottom dwellers. They're awful. You bring them to the light, they die. Just like sin, just like things in our lives, bring them up. They may, they're, they're ugly. That's why we don't bring them up. But if you bring the ugly up, guess what? It dies. (laughs) Glory to God. So repent, confess. And listen, when you repent and you can't get rid of it, that's a sign you need to confess it. Um, Make a plan to renew your mind. If you don't make a plan of how you're going to do better, you're not going to do it. Right? Right now, I've got a plan of 10 things I'm doing for my health. And I've got some commitment. I've got some people behind me doing that. I had to make a plan. Or I'm going to be the same forever. So make a plan. What am I going to do? I can't, I can't even focus on one chapter of the Bible. I'm going to focus on one verse. And I'm going to watch a preaching over and over again. I'm going to take notes during service. And then I'm going to review them the next day. People say, well, I don't remember what the sermon is. Well, write something down. Or listen to it all over again. Don't give your flesh an excuse. Four, guard your heart and renew Uh, learn new behaviors. That's one thing I've found with people that are like getting the truth or getting set free. If they don't guard their heart and guard what God is doing, often the enemy will come and muck it up. The Bible says not to put your pearls before the swine, lest they stomp on them, they rend them, and then they don't look as valuable. If God's doing something in you, go test that out with somebody that'll cheer for you. Let's seek God and see what he has to say. And that's what's happening there. So glory. So rub your elbows with somebody that has some faith. And then live your life of faith in front of those that aren't where you are or they don't know Jesus. If I brought out, I'm not a big ice cream fan, but some of y'all are. And if I brought me out a big ice cream cone, there's some of y'all going to go, can I have a lick of that? Or where did you get that? That's how it is with our faith. People that are hungry for the real thing are going to see you with it and go, where did you get that? Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. They see enough Pharisees. They need to see people that will love the truth, that will receive the word. They're correctable. You can correct me and instruct me. I'm not going to toast you and talk about you. I'm going to receive it. And when I receive it, other people are going to see that I'm getting better. Isn't that the way that the, uh, the work is supposed to go? Glory to God.